Okay, so now we'll take a look at the Apocalypse of Peter. This is episode six of our series on Gray's book. Okay, so now another thing, whenever you do early church canon, you have to rem always remember Apocalypse of Peter was an official part of the Bible for well over into the 300s. Uh, so Gray also omits any mention of one part of the early Christian canon, the Apocalypse of Peter, even though it had a recognizable negative prophecy by Jesus transparently about Paul. Wikipedia records the Muratorian fragment from the 200 states canon con included it, saying the Apocalypse also of John and Peter only do we receive, which some among us would not have read in church. This once canonical work has a prophecy by Jesus about Paul that is both obvious and negative. And before I read it to you, I just want to see what else we know about this book. Uh, this passage is at 1, verses 25 to 26 of the AOP, Apocalypse of Peter. In this scholarly work, Fred Lapham, Peter, the myth, the man in his writings, 2004 at 116. So I'm going to read this to you. You'll see where what it says. And I wanted to give you a little more background because... Um, We'll get a little bit more confidence in the Apocalypse of Peter. It's a legitimate book. Clement of Alexandria appears to have considered the Apocalypse of Peter to be Holy Scripture. Eusebius, in Historia Ecclesiae, Ecclesiae describes the lost work of Clements, the hypoptoso, whatever, that gave, quote, abridged accounts of all the canonical scriptures, not even omitting those that are disputed, I mean the book of Ju Jude and the other general epistles, also the epistle of Barnabas, and that called the Revelation of Peter. So you see, uh, you see, he said Clement listed out all these works. Now he's trying to say he included those that are disputed, but he means disputed by him. They were not disputed at the time he's listing them. Clement's an early writer. So the work must have existed in the first half of the second century. Clement is early, by the way, like in the... 120, 130 period to maximum, which is also the commonly accepted date of the canonic second epistle of Peter. Although the numerous references to it attest to it being once in wide circulation, the Apocalypse of Peter, Apocalypse of Peter was ultimately not accepted into the Christian canon. Okay, so we're, and basically it did not show up in the Synaiticus from about 340 AD. Okay. But uh, we've got a lot of other things. So what's the key What's the key statement in here? This is so important, Doug. I think this doesn't need any explanation. This is uh, what Jesus gives as a warning. And by the way, you'll see the same uh, end of days. The, the Son of Man prophecy occurs again. Jesus uh, meets his apostles, gives his last remarks before he's going to go through his suffering and everything. And it's so it, it reads a lot like the the uh, the canonical Gospels, too. All right, and there's nothing nothing unusual about this book uh, except this one quote. And they will cleave to the name of a dead man, thinking that they will become pure, but they will become greatly defiled, and they will fall into a name of error and into the hand of an evil, cunning man, and a manifold dogma, and they will be ruled without law. So one thing you need to know, again, to Roman Catholicism, which got rid of the law, banned it, said anyone who wanted to observe Sabbath is a Judaizer and it's against the law and all that because they're servants of the they were servants of uh, Constantine who was not truly a Christian a complete fraud and we'll, we'll go through that we have a, a whole series we're going to do on that one of these days and uh, he he believed in Saul Invictus and he did not want Paul to be thrown out of the Bible so he was trying to make sure we would keep him in there even if something like this Apocalypse of Peter all along had been warning about Paul. So you had Jude, James, Second uh, Peter, and now you have the Apocalypse of Peter all pointing right at Paul. And we got to get rid of those things. You know, Constantine says, because this is, my man is Paul. He gets rid of Sabbath. He tells them, tells the Galatians in chapter 3, if you observe Sabbath, you're cursed because you're going to have to keep all the law. And I love that. I love that. I'm Constantine. You'll You'll just make them stop resting on Sabbath, and they'll show up on, on Sunday at my worship services for my God, Saul Invictus. That's what Constantine's thinking, and that's what he's going to do, and that means this apocalypse of Peter has to go because it's in his way. Uh, we, we have more time to do somebody else. I mean, I could go through all of the things uh, here. I think it's also compatible with... Um, 
Second Peter. Okay. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to stop this one, but we're going to come we're going to do a little bit more we're going to do on uh Jerome's stinging critique. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. So now um again, if if you go to theological school, you have to know there's this big deal that Jerome made about Paul's hypocrisy. He and Augustine had this huge drag out beat up battle over uh, Jerome's trying to defend Peter's honor and Augustine doesn't care about Peter's honor and and Jerome's fighting him and saying hey you know what your your guy Paul beat up on my guy Peter and and so they're fighting back and forth okay so that's just to give you some background of what's going on here so Gray mentions that Jerome the translator of the Vulgate Bible in the late 300s and actually he delivered it in 405 AD to include the uh, New Testament translated thorn in 2 Corinthians 12 7 as stimulus in Latin Now you're gonna say what's this all about? Why are we looking at this issue? Because Gray says that this was a provocative translation, huh? Implying a hateful animus by Jerome towards Paul. So the word stimulus sounds whoa. It sounds sexual That's that's the only thing I can gather Gray is talking about. I don't think Gray Gray understands. For Gray says it now reads that Satan gave Paul a stimulus of the flesh, which Gray seemingly suggests sounds like some kind of sexual sin. This is only because he must not know Latin. All right, we're going to go have to go through this to explain it. However, Jerome translated the Greek 100% correctly. So let's show you why this is so. So I'm, I'm now here trying to defend Jerome from being accused. But th this is his alleged... What he's trying to say is Jerome made an anti-Paul statement by saying Paul had a stimulus of the flesh. And I'm just trying to show you, I'm now going to come to Jerome's defense and say he wasn't being anti-Paul, saying that he's a he's anti-Paul for some other reason, but not because of this. And so I think what he's trying to do is, is make Jerome look like he's scurrilous and accusing Paul of some sexual sin. No way. It's not what's going on here. And totally false. It did not remotely imply what Gray suggested. In Greek, the word scallops was not thorn, as typically inadvertently mistranslated in English. So he, he doesn't understand that Jerome is translating things correctly, and we have a lot of poor translations. So the, the, so the word scallops did not mean thorn. It meant a stinger, as from a scorpion, anything pointed, okay? Well, how did, so, so he's not using the word thorn, or what, what uh, Gray would expect to be the word for thorn, because he, Jerome, knows the word isn't thorn, it's stinger. So how did this, why does this controversy even exist? Dewey Rhymes has the word sting, and Latin Vulgate has sting. These are both correct. Gets this correct. The word stimulus in Latin thus had no sexual or sensual connotation. Hence, there was nothing provocative about James Jerome's translation of scallops in Greek into stimulus in Latin. So he's not making an anti-Pole remark. So I'm coming to his defense. He's innocent of this. Why did Jerome not choose thorn to translate scallops instead, thereby avoiding the use of stimulus? It is obvious if you study Greek. The word for thorn in Greek is spelled similarly, yet is distinctly different. Jerome knew the difference and did not make the mistake most English translations make today, and thus rendered it correctly as sting and not as thorn. Hence, the translation error in English of sting as thorn is seemingly how Gray is judging Jerome's fairness and animus in translating Paul. But Jerome was correct. In Latin, stimulus is a goad or prick or sting. Yet Gray, apparently unaware that both the Greek and Latin words involved mean stinger or, and sting, respectively, and thus they are synonymous, though Jerome had deliberately made a provocative anti-Paul translation, making it sound like stimulus. That's, an, that's a sexual thing. You're using English to translate stimulus. <laughs> I can't believe it. He's using the English perspective. Stimulus sounds sort of sexual, could I guess, in English. But in, in Latin, that's not what it means. It's a stinger. Due to Gray's mistake, you already want to hate Jerome as a salacious slanderer of Paul when and if you ever found out Jerome's true and well-known criticism. So he does have a criticism of Paul. And, and that's what I'm fighting for, that when he speaks about the issue, we do listen to him. We don't think he's making obscureless sexual accusations against Paul and trying to suggest things that he shouldn't be suggesting because there is no evidence to support that kind of thing. All right, so that's why we're being so careful here to stop Mr. Gray in misrepresenting Jerome, probably because Mr. Gray doesn't know 
how to translate the word thorn and stinger and stinger and, and what a stimulus is and so on. He doesn't know Latin. But what happens as a result of this, Gray never tells you Jerome's true and well-founded criticism of Paul. He spends all this time on the stinger versus stinging and stimulus and all that, and he wastes his time because what we really need to know is what's the criticism of Jerome that's famous? Books have been written about Jerome and Augustine's battle. I mean, this is, this is a big deal. This is a big deal in history, and popes wrote whole books on this whole issue. I mean, it's just, come on, tell us what was going on, Mr. Gray. We will next see that Gray missed one of the best-known criticisms of Paul in church history, the famous one by Jerome. Jerome was the most well-versed man in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin of his day. He spent literally decades translating the Bible into Latin. Jerome's criticism of Paul revolves primarily around Paul's response to Bishop James' inquiry in Acts 21, verse 21, about whether Paul was guilty of apostasia. That's in Acts 21, 21. You'll never see it if you read it in English. Sorry. James asks Paul to prove that rumors are false that Paul has become an apostate, which applies if Paul has thrown off the Mosaic law entirely from God's people. The law and apostasy is in Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 5, goes all the way to 10 as well. To disprove the rumors, Paul is asked by James, Bishop James, to honor, he's not an apostle, by the way, Jesus' is brother, James, to honor a vow from chapter 6 of Numbers in the Mosaic Law. Paul agrees to James' request and performs the vow Luke records. This vow requires Paul to shave his head, Numbers 6, verse 15. It was completed after about seven days of regular temple appearances by Paul. See Acts 21, verse 27, where Paul, he, <coughs> I think it's where Luke refers to. I'm going to take a break here. Okay, yeah, sorry. I needed a little sip of water there. <coughs> so, in Acts 21, 27, Paul refers to this. When the seven days were almost completed, uh, he was a reference to the seven days to do the Nazarite vow from the book of Numbers. So Paul is trying to prove to James, the bishop of Jerusalem, that he is law compliant. He's not an apostate. He's not telling people not to follow the law anymore. Now, what he should have done, turns out when we know Paul's epistles, he should have told him the truth. I'm an apostate. I believe the law no longer applies. I even teach all the Gentiles. They don't have to follow any of the law. It wasn't even given by God. It was given by angels through a mediator. And why do they want to obey uh, uh, those who are no gods when they try to do Sabbath? I, that's what he should have told him because that's in Galatians 3. And he wrote that years ago. And Acts 22, 21 is about 10 years after the book of Galatians was written, after his anti-Paul, anti-law writings of um, 1 Corinthians as well. All right, so let's keep going here. <clears throat> so he's, okay, but Jerome knows that, but J J James doesn't know it. So Jerome is knowing this, and he's having a battle with Augustine. He's trying to prove to Augustine, your man, Paul, is a liar. My man, Peter, is the right guy. So you see there's sort of that rivalry going on between the two of them. But that silence was broken by Jerome three centuries later, for Jerome knows that Paul's epistles are completely contrary to Paul's actions in Acts 21. For example, just look at Romans 7, 1 to 11, read Galatians chapter 3. So Jerome says Paul was clearly a hypocrite and misleading Bishop James as well as the 12. Listen to this scathing criticism. So talk about anti-Paul. Woo! I wouldn't even speak like this. This is just really, really strong. Oh, Paul, why then did you cause Timothy to be circumcised? Acts 16.3, contrary to your own convictions. I ask you again, Paul, why did you shave your head? That Nazarite vow you did in Acts 21, number 6.15, where you must shave your head. We've thus seen that for the fear of the Jews, Paul pretended that he observed the precepts of the law. This is quoted in Agenor Antoine Gasparin's The Concessions of the Apostle Paul and the Claims of Truth, 1854, at page 57. As a result, Jerome was stating facts that implied Paul fooled not only James, but also Luke by pretense. For Luke is assuming Paul's taking the vow for a week is a good thing to show about Paul and not an act of hypocrisy. Had Luke known this was a deception by Paul, as Jerome points out is obviously the case in light of Paul's epistles, Luke would likely not have compounded this deception by recording Paul's equally misleading statement in court that he endorses all the laws, saying to the judge, quote, I believe in everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, Acts 24, verse 14. 
Jerome's criticism thereby has very serious repercussions on the entire validity of Paul. It undermines the use of Acts by Paul defenders. For by Jerome putting two and two together, this means Luke apparently was duped into writing a favorable biography of Paul. Now, he needed to do that anyway for the court case that he was handling, but I mean, would he have put in things that are clearly deceptive acts by Paul? Probably not, because, you know, you just have to sometimes say truth is more important than letting someone deceive other people. But anyway, he was deceived. Luke was deceived. Paul cloaked his true views from Luke and not only from Bishop James. For example, even Paul's gospel was hid from Luke. That's what Paul says, my gospel is hid. Uh, and the 12, he hid it from Luke and the 12. Luke records that Paul says in his final court appearance in Acts 26, 20, this is his final court appearance in the book of Acts, I've declared my message, this is, I'm, in the original it's Paul speaking, so he, Paul, says, I declared my message both to them of, and his, that means his gospel, by the way, both to them of Damascus first and at Jerusalem and throughout all the country of Judea and also to the Gentiles. And listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, that they should repent and turn to God doing works worthy repentance, faith and works. Is that the gospel message of the Paul you and I read consistently in his epistles? Absolutely not. <laughs> Truly, Grace should have included this quote from Jerome that Paul hypocritically misled James and impliedly Luke too. Jerome's remark is one of the most mentioned criticisms of Paul thereafter in theological writings, all the way from Abelard to Aquinas. A millennium of this critique went on that Paul was a hypocrite and a liar, and nobody can deny it. And the reason why it became such an important thing is that Paul had the daring guts to put in the book of Galatians that he had dressed down Paul, Peter and called Peter a hypocrite. Why do you, Peter, uh, 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 hold back from sitting and eating with the Gentiles when the people from James come and you now want to make the Gentiles who don't live like Jews to live like a Jew when you don't even live like a Jew when Paul, when James people weren't around. So, so this whole battle where Paul uh, claims he dressed down Peter made Jerome want to come to Peter's defense and prove what a hypocrite and a liar is Paul. So Paul did not win a friend when he, when he attacked Peter because he lost one of the most important voices to be on your side in history, and that would have been Jerome. Not that I like Jerome that much. He got rid of uh, uh, the passage about this day I've begotten the, from the uh, baptismal account in ba both Matthew and Luke. A whole other story. But the point is this. You wouldn't want, him, you wouldn't want Jerome on against you, uh, Paul, and you got him fired up against you. So, wow. So, yes, Jerome, one of the most important voices of Christian history, Completely a legitimate Orthodox figure, it, it, you know, for, I mean, he wrote the Bible, he wrote the Bible, the Vulgate Bible. He was a center and he was an assistant to the Pope. I mean, it's like no, nobody almost like him. And he's anti-Paul to the core, to the core. And he fights this battle year after year with Augustine. And get this, as a side note, Jerome in the same letter says that Galatians 2.14, that if Augustine will not accept Paul was the only one acting as a false hypocrite in that passage. So Jerome says, I, one thing I, I, I can say this, maybe if Peter allowed Paul to put on a show, he could dress him down. That maybe was a co cooperative understanding between Paul and Peter, that Peter was allowing himself to be abused by Paul to just help Paul out, get more accepted by the Galatians. I mean, imagine that. Um, so, uh, so Jerome is saying, if you won't accept that, uh, Paul was the only one acting as a false hypocrite in this passage, then Galatians 2 14 represents a blasphemy by Paul or Peter, a ruler among the church and thereby was wrong for Paul to do it. Okay. So, uh, what he's saying there is I'll get the only other choice you have, Augustine, if you won't accept my view that uh, that the only solution to this that Paul is, is is gets away is that Paul is the false one here. He's 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 a, he's a liar. If if you don't accept that, then he he insulted, he blasphemed. That's how he puts it. Uh, uh, Peter by saying he was a hypocrite, and so you can just see he's given he's given Augustine no escape other than to admit that Paul's a liar, which is probably true. I mean, it's true that. Paul makes this up. Do you think that Paul really criticized Peter openly the way he says he did in Galatians? It's not recorded in the book of Acts. Paul 
is able to tell the Galatians whatever he wants, and nobody's going to validate it or not, because nobody seems to have any knowledge of this. Luke doesn't know. So Paul probably made it up and is lying about it. And so this is the only escape that uh, he gives Augustine. You've got to tell, tell us your guy's a liar. Otherwise, he if he's telling the truth, that he and, or it was a dress show between Peter and Paul, and they're just both pretending— which I think was Oregon's solution to the problem to in 200 AD, and so that these are the other options. Jerome saying I've discussed all the options, but if you won't accept those options, Augustine, both of which show Paul at least is in either one of the other two options, still being a deceiver. <clears throat> if, if you won't accept it, then your guy P- Paul it, it blasphemes. That's his word, <clears throat> Peter. So. No matter how it works out, Paul never comes out shining like a star, no matter how it works out. Okay, i got to stop this because my throat is itching and, cr- and hurting me. <coughs> All right, so that's going to be the end of episode six. I'm sorry my, my throat gave out there at the end. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, Jerome, big figure in history, anti-Paul to the core. And hard, hard, you know, basically uh, put Augustine in a, ba- a box that you have to accept your guy, your guy lied or is lying about lying? <laughs> no, excuse me. He's either lying about what he said that he dressed down Peter, or Peter and Paul pretended together that this ha- was happening for real, for the, the like play acting in front of them. If you won't accept either of those two options, where in each option Paul is lying, you have to accept the third option, which is he dressed down Peter and he violated the commandments of God, which he, he he himself admitted in his testimony in front of the high priest that it is wrong to insult a ruler of your people. And that's what he did. And an older man than himself. And so Jerome is just, you know, fuming at the, at the whatever. So the point is, yeah, Gray, how could you how could you leave it? How can you leave out Jerome of all people? OK, God bless everybody. We're going to get to the next episode and we'll see what else Gray did or did not treat thoroughly.